Hi everyone, welcome to Urban Water Management. So my name is Peter Bach and in the next 40-ish minutes I'm going to try and distill the complexities of managing water in urban areas uh, to try and cover the breadth of topics that we have to deal with uh, when we look at water in our cities. A bit about myself, so I'm a research scientist at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, also known as AIRVAG. Uh, it's part of the ETH domain. I did my bachelor and PhD uh, at Monash Uni, so I studied engineering and then branched out into the urban planning domain uh, and mostly around modeling and using computer models to help plan sustainable cities. I've delved not just in the water space, I'm actually looking more towards other areas as well that affect the way we manage water um, and the outcomes of good urban water management uh, for urban livability, for urban ecology, and how this all fits in when our city is growing and the way we plan and the way we develop policy changes over time. And ultimately, I'm looking into how we can use models to help stakeholders, the many different stakeholders in our urban areas, better engage in discussion, understanding each other's challenges and needs. So I guess starting, where to start? Starting with the drivers for urban water management is usually the way we go about it. Why do we need um, urban water management and what challenges do we face going forward? And we know cities are growing. Cities are growing quite rapidly. The United Nations came up with the World Urbanization Prospects Report and they've been revising it ever since. But with half the population now living in cities and this population expected to grow to about 6 billion by 2045, we are increasingly dealing with the need to provide sustainable urban water services. People need clean drinking water. We need to ensure that any wastewater is collected and treated. Um, and our landscape is being significantly altered from a natural state to a more urban anthropogenic state. And this doesn't uh, make it easier when we're dealing with climate change as well, because we've come to recognize that with changing rainfall patterns and this non-stationary um, behavior of climate, we can no longer adopt what we call a cookie cutter approach. Many recipe books, as you want to call it, um, recipe book approaches are no longer sustainable. We're dealing with more floods and droughts. And that all brings with it quite a lot of environmental degradation. Uh, there's been recent reports on biodiversity loss and that it's become a serious threat to the natural systems and our sustainability. Uh, and not to mention, we are also facing serious public health risk. But um, what does this all mean for urban water management? Well, there's an increasing to-do list. So the number of different objectives that we have to try and meet as we're developing and providing urban water services through our infrastructure is increasing. Um, we have to now become more aware that we may have to change the way we manage our water from year to year or you know in shorter time spans and this is all an economic challenge as well we have solutions for these issues um, but with all the economic investments that have to go into realizing these solutions building a business case becomes really really difficult so long story short lots of challenges and the question is how do we deal with them but let's start with really the basics. So water in the urban environment follows what we call an urban water cycle. We have many different aspects that we have to be aware of. And we can subdivide it into three basic components. We have water supply, providing safe uh, and clean drinking water to the people living in our cities. Uh, and that can include things like treating the water, First of all, where do we source it from? How do we treat it? And then how do we distribute this water to the people uh, across the city? Once this water is used, we end up with wastewater, um, polluted water that has to be dealt with because we can't simply discharge this into our nearby river or lake because this dirty water is going to pollute our environment and threaten the livelihood of the different ecosystems. And so we've come up with different measures of how we can deal with this waste um, and how we collect it in particular, how we then treat it and what we do with the outcome um, and whether, we, whether it goes back into our local rivers, lakes, uh, whether we pump it back into the ground. And a third component, which is very related to this sanitation aspect, is drainage. So whilst we have a fairly controlled system of how we collect water and how we dispose water, 
all of this is often complicated by the fact that we have rain in our cities and there's just a lot more water to deal with. And with increasing recognition that rainfall patterns are very sporadic, uh, very variable, we need to protect our cities from potential flood hazards, uh, from potential pollution, because traffic itself in our cities can leave a lot of pollutants behind, which can then threaten the environment. So drainage is the third and also just as important component uh, in this, call it trifecta, of the urban water environment. This, of course, cycles around. A lot of the water that we discharge into our rivers and lakes will be withdrawn at a later stage in time to supply the city once again. So the basic urban water system pretty much com uh, comprises supply, sanitation, and drainage. So it's about securing a safe and accessible supply of clean water, um, typically from a nearby river, lake, or groundwater catchment. Uh, we also look into desalination of seawater uh, because we do have a pretty big supply from the oceans. However, that in itself brings a lot of different challenges. And then we have sanitation, where we co collect the unused or used waste water and treat it before we discharge it to the surrounding environment uh, for environmental reasons and also for public health reasons. And finally, drainage, managing these large volumes of water from rainfall by collecting it and conveying it out of our city efficiently to avoid flooding and damage to property. So if we start with the urban water supply, and I'm going to go through each of these briefly um, and to give you a bit of an overview of each of them and what's what we have to think of in terms of these different components. Uh, Melbourne is a very good example. Melbourne, Australia is a very good example um, where we can look at water supply. Uh, and I'll be taking qu quite a bit few examples from Melbourne uh, because I've worked there for 11 years and I've dealt with a lot of the stakeholders within uh, Melbourne, Australia. So the water supply itself, Melbourne's a pretty big city. It's sprawled. It's about 8,000 square kilometers if you consider the entire metropolitan region. It's probably reached 9,000 by now, actually. Um, but the water supply is managed in various stages, and we can subdivide it into three different scales, the macro scale, meso, and the micro scale. We have a lot of the water sourced from natural catchments, um, reservoirs, which Melbourne Water, the Water Authority, uh, in charge of what we call the bulk water supply managers. And these reservoirs are protected areas. So you can't usually access these areas and it ensures that a lot of the water falling onto these catchments um, fill up the reservoirs and remain fairly clean so that minimal effort is required. At the macro scale, this water is collected and then managed uh, and built to water utilities. So we have three water utilities within the metro region that then manage this water. Um, it, they buy the supply from Melbourne Water and then disinfect it and treat it and distribute it through a local reticulation network. Most of the time, because of large pumping distances, some of the water is stored in intermediate storages, these large uh, storage tanks, uh, an example of which is shown here. Um, this is then reticulated to the uh, to the community uh, who are then billed as consumers. So there's two different stages of billing that happens, uh, one for the bulk water supply and then one by the consumers who then consume the water and themselves may also do something at the household scale. That's where we come to the micro scale. So in Australia itself, because we've had experience with drought, um, people have also gone and harvested their rainwater or reused their grey water. For those who are not uh, familiar with it, grey water is the cleaner portion of the wastewater, which we normally can obtain from showers, from taps. Uh, and it's water that can, with minimal treatment, not cause any major public health risk, uh, but can actually be reused for things like watering your garden or flushing your toilet. So as I mentioned, in Melbourne, um, the governance of water supply is at these different levels. You have the water authority, Melbourne Water, who are responsible for managing these large assets, these large res reservoirs, and maintaining the levels and reporting back on how full our reservoirs are, who then collect this water and supply it to three water utilities. These are the companies that deal with the consumers who are responsible for maintaining a lot of the distribution network, uh, for ensuring that pipe bursts such as this one here um, are actually managed and dealt with accordingly so that we don't waste our precious resource. And they are the ones who then interact with uh, responsible for consuming the water, but also can on their own harvest 
alternative water sources to reduce the potable water consumption. More recently, there's also been a more uh, broader adoption of what we call a third pipe or recycled water network, uh, which can uh, sit in between the utilities and the consumers. Typically, larger developments uh, will have these schemes in place, uh, and these purple pipes, they're literally purple in color, uh, will have recycled water treated to a standard not for drinking, but a standard that is sufficient for use for various um, things like toilet flushing or garden watering. These pipes will usually be in place and managed fairly centrally. So when I say centrally, at the development level by the responsible utility. Desalination, of course, is one other source of water and has been a pretty, uh, pretty disputed topic, particularly in Victoria, the state of Victoria, where Melbourne is in, um, because we went through a pretty long drought. And it's a pretty energy intensive process where we try and remove the salt from seawater and provide a, I guess, a, a secure supply of uh, clean drinking water. You can have a look a bit into the, the history of desalination in Melbourne, but it was pretty disputed during the drought time. Decisions were rushed to establish a desalination plant, which towards the end of the drought, um, the drought broke roughly when the plant was completed. Um, towards the end of that drought, this plant basically did not uh, start operating until many years later. I think now at the moment, um, keeping up with the news, the plant is trying to produce a bit of clean water for, uh, for water supply to try and augment uh, the levels in the reservoirs because we have been seeing declines in reservoir levels across the state. Moving on to sanitation. Um, it's seen as the greatest medical advance since the 1840s. There have been a lot of um, outbreaks in waterborne diseases across the world uh, during these uh, in urbanized areas during the 1800s, and sanitation systems were implemented in response to this uh, because realizing that uh, by not dealing with the wastewater and not treating it to, um, I guess, cleaner standards, we've noticed that the outbreaks of uh, waterborne diseases increased. Cholera being perhaps the most um, the most prevalent one, and so it's it's seen as the greatest medical advance. It's actually strange to think that infrastructure itself um, can deliver a strong medical benefit, but it shows the importance of um, acceptable and sustainable urban water management, and the multiple benefits that it can bring. How does the sanitation system work? Generally, we have three components. You have the wastewater generation, which will differ depending on whether you're in households or whether you're working in an industry. Um, different industrial uh, processes will generate different levels of pollution in wastewater. Uh, so think of chemical plants versus just simple uh, warehousing and storage versus agriculture. You'll have many different types of pollutants in the water. This is typically collected in a large network of sewer systems. An example is shown here and is then sent to a wastewater treatment plant where the water is then treated to an acceptable level, um, not for drinking, but safe for the environment and safe to protect um, the public health, and is then discharged according to specific regulations and guidelines into the nearby, um, a nearby water body, whether it's a lake or typically a river. In Europe, we see a lot of cities built along rivers for the water supply aspect, um, and it's also these same water bodies that the wastewater is then typically discharged into. One thing to consider about sanitation systems, uh, and this is also a big difference in uh, across the world, is that we have two different types of sewer systems. We have combined versus separate sewer systems. The big difference is that combined sewers are designed to collect not only the wastewater, but also any storm water that drains from the city. So when it typically rains on the city, the water has to go somewhere. And in a combined sewer, that water is typically drained into the existing sewer system and the entire volume uh, goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Now, this is a fairly efficient process. However, it can often lead to uh, overloading of the treatment plant. It can lead to unexpected discharges of untreated wastewater into a nearby river because the system is overloaded. So think of a massive rainfall in our city uh, and the, the potential of flooding these pipes will have a certain a capacity. And if, that's, if the amount of rainfall exceeds that capacity, well, we're not looking too good. Um, 
And so typically you'll have overflow structures. We call them combined sewer overflows. They are situated uh, across a particular catchment. And oftentimes during heavy rainfall, you will have spills from these combined sewer overflows. Uh, and this can cause some environmental damage. Uh, on the opposite end, in Australia, for example, we have separate sewer systems where stormwater is dealt with separate to wastewater. This provides a bit more control to uh, wastewater treatment and management, but of course it adds an entire new piece of infrastructure to the city that has to also be managed. So something to consider. I think the based on what I've seen, many cities are starting to move towards this separate system. We are finding through different types of new infrastructure ways to better deal with our stormwater. And so separating the systems will allow better control of wastewater volumes because we can we, we have a certain level of um, predictability in how much wastewater we can expect to flow into our plants. The reduced volumes of water will also ensure that wastewater treatment plants do not have to be upgraded so soon if the city grows. Uh, and this is a this is a serious concern because it can cost several millions of dollars to upgrade the capacity of a treatment plant. So I see a general trend towards separating these systems, but of course, as I've mentioned, it brings with it a whole new entire piece of infrastructure that has to be managed. So the basic components uh, and the basic tra uh, basic chain in a wastewater system. When we're talking about combined sewers, we consider the catchment, so the entire area uh, where the wastewater comes from. It gets drained into a sewer system uh, along with the stormwater that goes to a treatment plant and it gets treated and then discharged into the receiving water body. And in a separate sewer system um, that is separate from the stormwater system, we have the catchment, the stormwater, which usually goes into the receiving body, and the sewer system, which diverts the wastewater to a wastewater treatment plant. Now, you're probably thinking, if we, are, if we have a separate stormwater system and the stormwater is polluted from all the traffic in the city and a lot of other um, pollutants that get uh, deposited by air and uh, just generally by activities in the urban areas, what happens to the stormwater? Well, I'll get to that shortly. Um, I mentioned overflow structures. Uh, these combined sewer overflows, they are storage structures, but when they are overloaded, it spills untreated um, mixed stormwater sewage into receiving waters. Normally in combined systems, management has to try and minimize the number of times these systems spill and the overall volume that is spilled into the receiving waterways. In a separate system, we also have these kinds of um, sewer overflows, but they're called emergency relief structures. So we try and convey the stormwater as best as we can, um, but we also have the occasional um, cross connections because plumbers may have um, may have little knowledge of the overall um, pipe system in certain areas, and it can happen at times that wastewater enters the stormwater system um, by accident. Apart from that, we have pumping stations and the wastewater treatment plant at the end of the line. So a bit about these sewer overflows. So like I said, separate systems can still suffer from sewer overflow events. Uh, and this is because of a number of different issues. Uh, you can have cracked pipes. Uh, pipes are not, uh, you know, they're not sturdy. You can have potential leakages from it. And sometimes these things drain into the stormwater system through certain passages, either subsurface or um, through, um, through infiltration into a pipe. Uh, we can have cross connections because of mistaken, um, mistaken connections between pipes and mistaken identity, call it that. And we can also have just general maintenance issues um, associated with the infrastructure. And hence why even in a separate system, we still have emergency relief structures, which provide some level of sedimentation. So the real nasty chemicals um, or nasty sediments that have metals and other types of uh, pollutants associated with them can settle out uh, before this dirty water is discharged into a receiving waterway. Um, a very common issue that we find in wastewater, and we call this general area urban drainage management, um, so the wastewater stormwater aspects, a very common issue we find is that Areas in the bays, in cities where people normally go to swim, can on occasion, after long heavy rainfalls, uh, become unswimmable because they pose a public health risk. Uh, there's an example in the news from Australia, but there's also another famous example in Copenhagen where 
there was an event. Um, it was a sports competition. I think it was a triathlon. And they went ahead and hosted the event. But the days bef- leading up to the event, there was some heavy rainfall and some serious discharges and spills into the bay uh, around Copenhagen. So people ended up falling sick and this became a huge issue in the news. So definitely something um, to really monitor and uh, is of interest uh, to a lot of uh, water managers. There are a number of challenges when you manage sewer systems. It's not just about the wastewater itself, it's also about blockages in the sewer. We find many different things that are flushed through toilets uh, that are carried by the wastewater in the sewers. And these can cause serious blockages in the system. And so often managers have to also go and make sure that the sewer systems are clear so that the wastewater can flow uh, to the treatment plant. We talk of this self-cleansing velocity. Sometimes if there is not much wastewater discharge into the sewer system, the flow of the water is not strong enough to actually push with it a lot of the pollutants that, um, that come with it. This itself leads to these blockages that I've mentioned, um, and the solids would end up depositing inside the pipes themselves. Uh, This is something that is analyzed normally uh, through models and through inspection and through measurements, uh, but is a very crucial thing. So sometimes it's not just about having too much wastewater, but we also face problems when we have too little wastewater. Uh, And this is an interesting interaction that we see when we start introducing recycling, wastewater reuse, because all these sustainable measures, supposedly sustainable, will end up affecting our existing centralized infrastructure and can cause serious issues uh, down the track. So part of the reason this is a big issue is because if we leave a lot of this this waste inside the sewer pipes, it can generate what we call um, hydrogen sulfite, which is a very corrosive um, chemical, a, a compound, Uh, and can lead to issues with the pipe integrity down the track. And then we end up with broken pipes, and that requires uh, more rehabilitation, replacement, and a lot of uh, maintenance. In terms of wastewater treatment, when we get to the plant, we normally consider uh, three different stages, primary, secondary, tertiary. In the primary stage, we screen out major sediments and solids, then that usually goes to some biological form of treatment where we remove nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients using bacterial processes. And then finally, a more advanced stage where we target a lot of difficult chemicals, uh, pharmaceuticals or uh, hydrocarbons that get, um, that, that get deposited by traffic and um, other processes in the urban environment. And usually that effluent is discharged into the receiving water body and there are strict environmental and regulatory guidelines, not just about uh, what concentrations of certain indicator chemicals you're allowed to have in your final product, but also the frequency with which you discharge. A lot of it is based on also the flow of the river themselves. There are new measures um, in place for wastewater management. Uh, You'll notice this book down here. Uh, It's actually a very nice um, guideline for how we design these systems. So if you're interested, you can have a look into this uh, particular book. We call it the Bible of Wastewater Engineering. We are starting to call this practice uh, resource recovery rather than wastewater treatment and disposal. And that's because we find that there are new ways we can, instead of discharging this wastewater, um, feed it back into our water supply systems. um, Because sometimes the treated water... Um, once it's gone through the tertiary uh, stage, the final stage of treatment, can sometimes be cleaner than the receiving environment. And so why not mix it with our reservoir water, allowing it to then, I guess, dilute and disperse and basically assimilate its quality to that which we use for our drinking water anyway. Now, there's been a lot of political pushback and community pushback about this idea, but it's starting to become more accepted, um, at least in concept, and there are some smaller schemes now around the world that are trying to, uh, trying to put this into place. So that was the water side of things. And the final aspect um, about wastewater management and wastewater treatment and reuse is the sludge management. So in removing all these pollutants, we end up with a lot of solids left over. Uh, this, these solids are usually captured and are dealt with as well. They are digested, they are burned and treated. Uh, so that they are no longer a public health risk. And often they're then disposed either to a landfill or they're used in agricultural applications. 
So that was a quick overview, but wastewater management is a huge topic and there are lots of um, research groups around the world that look into every aspect of it, as well as the interaction across the entire system. For example, how we can maximize uh, the capacity in our sewer systems during a heavy weather event to help the wastewater treatment plant cope with the increased load. There are groups looking into how we can optimize treatment uh, across the different stages in the plant to ensure that we achieve maximum uh, efficiency. In terms of regulation, uh, there are two examples to think about around this. Uh, one, in, uh, one in Australia that I'm offering you is the State Environmental Protection Policy. These guidelines uh, have been in place since uh, the 1970s and really designates the protection of key areas around Victoria uh, and uh, regulates the discharge requirements. It is this, these guidelines that the Environment Protection Authority in Victoria, so the EPA in Victoria, uh, makes a lot of decisions around and helps um, helps approve permits for wastewater managers to discharge their treated wastewater. And it's also these guidelines that Melbourne Water, the authority I mentioned earlier, uh, works by when we are faced with um, uh, issues of water quality and pollution that there are no actual regulations in place for. It's a, it's a fairly blanket policy across the state um, and it helps really protect water environments uh, by providing that blueprint on what is an agreed environmental outcome. Uh, so it's in place and helps frame more local scale policies for many different um, water authorities, municipalities to manage both their wastewater and stormwater. Uh, in Europe, for example, we also have the Water Framework Directive, which came into effect around the early 2000s and called for a greater coordination among the different uh, countries to protect receiving waters uh, and the river basins in general. What's interesting about the Water Framework Directive is that it urged, a more, it urged better collaboration between the different countries because a river does not care about where political boundaries are. A river will flow from its source to its sink. And in Europe, we have a lot of rivers that cross many different countries. The interesting thing about the Water Framework Directive, however, is that it did not set any clear standards. Rather, it urged the different countries to understand what is a good chemical and ecological status for their particular waterway. Um, and so this very vague terminology has sort of led to a lot of confusion among different um, different countries. But the general understanding is really looking at what are some key indicators for ecological and chemical protection and looking at how the surface water and the groundwater beneath the surface interact. Uh, and then to design policies around making sure that whatever we do here in the upstream portion of this river will maintain the good ecological status of this river so that the downstream portions are not severely affected by the consequences as well. And trying to think in what we call a more integrated manner and in a more, I guess, cooperative manner to ensure that the externalities from one management and one, uh, one country does not, uh, is not as impactful um, on the others. In terms of wastewater management, we also have decentralized techniques. Um, so we don't just do central treatment where we have, you know, your sewers and out of sight, out of mind mentality, which has been a very traditional approach. But we are slowly opening up to many different decentralized options. Um, and some examples include composting toilets, uh, source separation, urine diverting toilets. Uh, this is an interesting concept, particularly in Switzerland. We research it a lot here because a lot of the nutrients are often contained in the urine. Uh, and if we can separate that at the source, when that happens, then the amount of treatment needed and the amount of time and efficiency can definitely be improved uh, dramatically. Uh, in fact, at Erwag, we have a huge project that looks into making fertilizer out of the harvested urine through some key treatment processes. Gray water treatment, as I mentioned, this idea of harvesting water from your shower uh, or from taps in the bathroom or from your laundry as well. Uh, treating it and using it for then toilet flushing or uh, subsurface irrigation. So in Australia, for example, if we use grey water for irrigation, we have to use it subsurface because of a potential exposure to, um, to dirty water, so unclean water. Um, urine diverting toilets have had quite a lot of success in terms of the engineering of it, and there have been quite a lot of case studies. Uh, this particular paper gives you a bit of an idea. If you're interested, you can have a look at it. 
Um, there are a lot of um, a lot of successful case studies, and it's been a lot of testing, but there are still problems with public perception. Uh, a lot of the risks associated with using the urine as a fertilizer source uh, and the need for many governing bodies to be involved in this particular process if it is to become a mainstream um, a mainstream solution. We are at that demonstration stage, but it is something that hopefully in the coming years we can really uh, push because it really closes this loop where we have a potential source of nutrients that we can really use for agriculture uh, and other purposes and why not leverage this so a very interesting uh, example of what we call a decentralized form of wastewater management that is gaining traction across the world one other aspect um, and i'm already hinting out i'm talking about centralized and decentralized management we have this notion of managing a lot of our urban water services in a centralized manner where we collect everything to a central point we treat it or we, you know, we prepare the water for drinking or we make sure that all the storm water is, um, has been taken from the city to protect the city from flooding. Uh, and then we deal with it at, in one spot. However, this is not a sustainable model, uh, especially when cities are growing. It is becoming a lot harder to try and maintain this central management because it's, the system is getting more complex. We are dealing with a lot of the infrastructure that has to also be replaced because a lot of it is reaching the end of their life cycle. And the amount of objectives, as I mentioned, this to-do list is getting longer and longer. Um, and so recent research, and this is a very interesting paper into uh, centralized versus decentralized wastewater management, uh, is starting to realize that a centralized option is not necessarily the most optimal solution and that at times... We don't need to connect an entire city to a single sanitation system. We can manage our sanitation in many different uh, clusters. Uh, and so these, uh, these researchers in this paper define what we call an optimal degree of centralization, that as um, urban water managers, we are starting to try and pursue, to try and understand, given our particular urban area, what is an optimal degree of centralization for water management? Do we... Do we manage maybe the western portions and the eastern portions? Do we manage uh, water supply in a central manner, but then everyone is responsible for decentralized management? And this is something that um, quantitative methods, modeling, uh, a lot of data gathering can really help identify. On to drainage. So the third aspect of the urban water management trifecta. Now, urbanization with it brings with it a lot of anthropogenic surfaces. We concrete over our areas with um, you know, paving, asphalt. We have you know, beautiful patios that we like to sit on in our homes. Office buildings are you know, large monolithic um, structures with lots of parking lots that basically do not allow any water to infiltrate. This is a very different behavior of our catchment compared to a natural system where rain falls, um, there's evaporation happening, some of the water will flow into our receiving waterways and a lot of it will go into the ground. And this natural, uh, this altered natural state, uh, this altered state of the natural environment brings with it huge problems because we are dealing with larger volumes of water than normal and these volumes can cause flooding, they can cause a, a lot of other issues. Just to illustrate uh, in a more quantitative way, what do we get when we urbanized? Well, for one, we have higher peaks, so the amount of water flowing off comes at a much quicker rate because concrete and asphalt is really efficient at making water flow off surfaces and diverting water into a receiving water. So we end up with higher peaks, we end up with more runoff, and at the end, this can cause a number of issues. Um, with the larger volumes and the higher flows, our riverbanks can get eroded quite quickly. This has, this has serious implications on the local ecology, on the state of the river as well, because the erosion will release sediment into the waters, which can have a lot of impacts on the aquatic ecosystem. Not to mention all the stuff that gets deposited by um, urban activities, oil, grease, nutrients, contaminants, uh, metals, pathogens, these things will find their ways to receiving water bodies. Now imagine that we want to go for a swim in the river. With all these things going into the river, I think we probably think twice about going for an afternoon swim. So in comes stormwater management. Um, 
And so we have different ways we can deal with this stormwater that's hitting on our cities. And a lot of these have slowly established themselves as good solutions. On the one hand, we have these structural solutions, so drainage infrastructure, pits and pipes, which we can use to collect the stormwater to protect from flooding um, and protect from um, nightmares, I guess, relating to water around our cities, uh, causing some uh, havoc to traffic and, uh, and local areas. Um, but they convey it, they convey the water out quite efficiently, which can itself bring a whole string of other nightmares. Uh, to try and combat that in recent decades, so the past 20 years, we've also had a lot of emergence of what we call decentralized nature-based solutions. These are systems that we put in place to mimic natural processes, such as constructed wetlands, uh, infiltration systems to try and promote water going into the subsurface, uh, as well as large open spaces to try and collect the water so that we can drive local evapotranspiration. And along with those many different um, controls that we can use to help manage the amount of stormwater that is generated. So development controls being policies in place, charging people for paving over natural surfaces, um, encouraging people to disconnect the downpipes from their houses so that the stormwater does not actually reach the drainage system. But this is not an, an easy task to manage. And even with these management options, we still face flood risk because drainage systems cannot convey large, uh, large volumes of water. We still deal with pollution of receiving waterways. Uh, we will still deal with these erosion and geomorphic changes to rivers, which can have an ecological impact. And more recently, what has been recognized is urban areas tend to be warmer than the surrounding rural environments. Now, why is this? This is because we have a reduced um, evapotranspiration in cities, and this process is quite important for removing some of the heat uh, in the urban environment. So during the day, we can end up having much warmer areas in the city. And you may notice when you go to parks, you'll feel a lot cooler normally. Uh, so this urban heat island phenomenon has also become an emergent issue that we are now trying to manage by maintaining stormwater in our urban areas through a number of different options. So I mentioned this blue-green infrastructure, this decentralized nature-based solutions, it has a number of different names uh, and has been known differently across the world. In America, we I think they tend to use low-impact development or sustainable urban drainage systems. In Australia, we call it water-sensitive urban design. Um, I use the umbrella term blue-green infrastructure. It is the, I guess, the newest term that is being used to really describe a whole range of these systems that have natural and engineered components and that serve to help um, drive uh, ecosystem services in our cities. So these infrastructure are heavily researched around the world and are being incorporated into stormwater management. Um, there's a number of different considerations when designing them, and this is really a, an interdisciplinary topic. We face choices of what systems to use. It's a very, it's a very flexible uh, design process because we can put these systems in the, our backyards, we can put them in our local neighborhood streets, but we can also make larger systems in a, in a big park at the downstream end of a catchment. There's a number of different objectives or ecosystem services that these um, systems can provide. And the scale of the application um, becomes a big consideration because that also determines what systems may be more effective than others. A very common um, interesting issue to deal with is the location of these systems. Often there's competition for space in cities. We want to build new houses, but we also have to manage our stormwater effectively. We also want to provide areas for recreation and amenity. So location choice becomes um, a particularly challenging task. And finally, these systems are meant to be, um, they're meant to be promoting water in the urban environment. Um, whereas our pipes are beneath the ground, so out of sight, out of mind, these systems adopt a very different principle, the opposite in fact, where it's about urban design and integrating them with urban design. So these systems are a particularly challenging task to design. Uh, but they have, we have learned a lot about them in recent decades. And it's now becoming more of a logistical challenge and a challenge among stakeholders because different stakeholders are involved. Um, but it is definitely, uh, we, we, are, we definitely understand the engineering and the science behind them a lot better than we did um, 10 years ago. But as you can see, if we then look at how these systems affect the water balance, we notice that they promote greater infiltration, uh, 
um, and we that they promote treatment of the stormwater before it gets discharged into the receiving waterways. So when we look at the workflow <coughs> for blue-green infrastructure planning, some of you might be familiar with the international standards of just generally infrastructure planning and delivery. And blue-green infrastructure is no different to this. We have different stages, starting from the planning uh, through to design, some approvals process that then allows the asset to proceed to construction. Because these infrastructures normally require some time before plants establish, um, this period is then considered uh, before an asset handover takes place, uh, upon which operation and routine maintenance can begin. Sometime down the road, 10, 20 years, every now and then, some major renewal works have to be performed on these infrastructures, and that can sometimes lead to revising the design to cope with uh, unexpected um, changes that could not be predicted during the design stages. Now, in my research itself, I've had the opportunity to delve into this workflow quite in intensively, and I've spoken to a lot of practitioners across Australia. Uh, in regards to these different stages. And we find that the whole process itself is very iterative. Uh, there are a number of different stakeholders involved, often municipalities, or as we call them, local councils uh, in Australia, are in charge for a lot of the drainage infrastructure and the management thereof. And so they tend to take the lead in planning and designing these systems. Councils or municipalities usually come up with major policy documents that prescribe some of the vision, uh, visions that they'd like to achieve over the next 10, 20, 30 years within the council. Uh, these policy documents normally also go into projected growth uh, and areas of new development or redevelopment. So planning and design is usually done uh, by the councils in conjunction with the water authorities, uh, as well as local engineering consultants who then take over a lot of the engineering work, figuring out how big the systems have to be, uh, and what has to go into the creation of these systems to meet the specific objectives that the council would like to meet. It is also in these initial stages where <clears throat> some key objectives are defined. What do these systems um, want to achieve? Traditionally in Australia, it's been all about achieving uh, stormwater runoff control as well as uh, pollution management, uh, because as I mentioned before, these separate systems, the stormwater is normally discharged directly into a receiving waterway. It is generally less polluted than wastewater, but it can still cause quite significant harm to receiving environments and can pose a public health risk, particularly when there are some severe storms that can wash off a lot of the pollutants uh, from our urban catchments. But councils are also looking into the potential amenity benefits if you look into the research, there's a lot of papers that look at epidemiolog epidemiological studies of green spaces and how they can help human health because they provide areas for recreation, but also a lot of mental health benefits. Um, natural spaces generally help reduce anxiety and depression uh, in urban uh, dwellers and can serve as a place for social gatherings. <coughs> so. The planning and design stage is usually done iteratively upon which an approval process happens. And this is very different across the various states in Australia, let alone probably elsewhere in the world as well. And the approval process is usually involves revising the designs to meet required standards set forth by the council or water authority. Interesting example is Melbourne in particular, where Melbourne Water the major water authority, also the bulk water supplier, has to maintain the state, the natural state um, of the system and to maintain the health thereof. And so they usually get involved when the catchment that is being considered is greater than 60 hectares. We call this the 60 hectare catchment rule. Melbourne Water also gets involved with uh, local developers when they build new estates and they find that they can't fit these kinds of assets within uh, within the space that they've um, got to design and develop the new residential housing. Um, and in which case, Melbourne Water actually has a scheme where the developer pays uh, Melbourne Water a certain fee that is equivalent to what one of these systems would cost to meet the water quality standards. So in Victoria and Australia, we have a standard set in place that all new residential developments have to meet best management practices. Now, what does that mean? So there are prescribed uh, targets for water quality. So 
They have to reduce sediments in runoff by a certain percentage, as well as the nutrients entering local waterways. And they, councils or developers have to demonstrate that the systems they put in place and the measures they put in place, whether it's a piece of infrastructure or policy, can actually meet that. After approval, um, the system normally then gets constructed and municipalities either do it by themselves or uh, developers will hire an independent contractor to construct these systems. What's interesting uh, that I find in this kind of process is that a lot of the faults that we find in these systems already happen in the construction phase because many contractors are not used to these kinds of interesting new types of technologies. And so they just use whatever measures they, they see fit to try and deliver a product as fast as possible. Um, and at the end, if there are no proper checks in place, uh, a lot of these systems can actually be constructed incorrectly and don't function as intended. And this is often found uh, quite early on when operation begins. Fortunately, there are uh, policies in place or measures in place, such as a defects liability period, where these kinds of problems can be rectified. In terms of operation and routine maintenance, that in itself, again, involves a completely different set of actors. Councils normally will have an infrastructure management team uh, from experience and chatting with many different uh, people across the country, uh, we find that these teams are often divided into an engineering assets team, a garden team, and a landscape and natural, um, natural assets team. So how do you actually allocate a maintenance budget to them when these blue-green infrastructures normally are com combinations of all three? Who actually maintains it? Who is responsible for it? These kinds of questions are still prevalent across Australia and without a doubt I'm sure these are prevalent across the world as well and these are things we have not quite understood how to deal with yet. This gets further complicated when you start constructing systems that harvest rainwater or stormwater for garden irrigation or other alternative uses because that's when the responsibility becomes shared between a water utility whose responsibility is to provide water supply for these particular uses and the local council whose responsibility is to ensure that the drainage is sufficient and that stormwater is managed accordingly. And so keep a lookout in future as I'll be trying to bring some of this work out and reporting back on some of these findings. But this is, I guess, part of the, the interest in my research and why I'm trying to use models to try and support this process, because models can help us understand how to better manage and how to better um, discuss a lot of these shared responsibilities um, among the different stakeholders in the urban water sector. So to sort of summarize what this whole workflow entails, we really have many different stakeholders across the entire process from you know, big high-level players, authorities, uh, regulators, as well as developers at the early stages over to the people who end up owning the assets and within their own organization, such as a municipality who has planning departments and operation departments and asset management um, who have to then try and coordinate. And this coordination is not there yet, but it's certainly a very interesting story, of, interesting story of governance that uh, we can follow in the years to come. There are... I guess there's progress made, but um, there's still a lot to be learned in this process. There are a lot of institutional challenges around blue grid infrastructure. We understand the engineering around it, but because it's still such a new technology, there's still a lot of risk aversion. Um, not to mention it is considered yet another piece of infrastructure. If you think about what a council has to manage, you know they've got roads, they've got urban green spaces, <clears throat> they have the drainage infrastructure. They also have, you know, civic facilities like libraries, as well as, you know, all the schools that they want to make sure uh, function accordingly and uh, operate it well and provide all the local services to the residents. So if this is another piece of infrastructure, how do we actually finance and manage these, especially when uh, we're starting to deal with these multi-responsibilities, such as the stormwater harvesting examples I mentioned earlier? Because it's so new, there's also a lack of capacity. People do not yet fully understand how to manage these systems and how these systems actually work. It is a multidisciplinary challenge. We're dealing with you know, people in engineering, but also people in botany, plant sciences. How do these plants actually work? How do you maintain plant health? Um, these are natural systems, and they're trying to mimic natural processes. And whilst we know a lot about theory, 
and how these systems work from experimental data and field monitoring from research studies, there is still a lot of uh, well, a lack of data because many of these systems are not monitored. For those interested, you can contact me and I can give you a, a link to a study where we looked at the thousands of systems already implemented across Melbourne. And it's been a very opportunistic thing where people can do new infrastructure. People try it out of demonstration because it's more like a fashion trend rather than a necessity. There's also been pushback and backlash. Um, we tend to notice this in some of the interviews with stakeholders where they refer to these 50-year-old engineers who are set in their ways. Uh, we term them dinosaurs because they've been doing things for years. They're used to it. Why should they change the way they're doing a lot of the engineering? And so, um, you know, there's, there's no certainty that these systems work completely. Um, so one failed case study often becomes the trigger to not do these systems any further. So we call this this failed case study mentality. There have been stories where a single council got burnt by a few failed cases and have decided to just take that risk averse approach. Politics at the much higher level can also influence this quite substantially. In Brisbane, for example, the Brisbane City Council, which manages most of the Brisbane metropolitan area, has been a pretty big champion in these kinds of systems. But it, all it took was one election where a premier was voted in who pretty much cut a lot of the, um, a lot of the initiatives, and there was a lot of red tape that uh, resulted from that. Another final aspect that is also a bit of a pushback is this NIMBY mentality, not in my backyard. Um, these systems can be scaled. You can have, you know, you can have a bioretention system, so a little, uh, little basin with a filter that can treat the storm water coming off your roof and your pavements to a good qu water quality standard. And it's very small. It's a small footprint, um, but people just don't want it in their backyard. They are happy if it's out there somewhere doing its job, but you know, once people are uh, involved in the process. Um, they start to shy away from these initiatives. So it's still a big issue. And it's not something that we only see in urban water. We see this in energy as well. I mean, you can see the comic here. It's kind of funny, but it's very true, um, where people rather not deal with it. Out of sight, out of mind is still a big issue. I guess on that topic of asset management, I feel this is the best time to also sort of highlight that asset management in urban water systems is not an easy task. Um, there's a lot of financial, economic, and engineering considerations. Um, we define this as applied to physical assets. Uh, and there's a lot of papers out there that talk about what asset management entails. The most important thing, I guess, to realize once we're talking about urban water systems, especially of what we're dealing with today, is we have centralized water supply, sanitation, and drainage infrastructure. These pipes on the ground are usually designed for lifespans of 50 to 100 years. Many of them are nearing that lifespan now, and we have to now make decisions about whether to keep going with business as usual or whether we want to change the way we do things. This is where the centralized versus decentralized debate comes up again. Blue-green infrastructure, in addition to this, is designed typically for a 20 to 50 year lifespan, but there is evidence that these systems can last longer if they're maintained. After all, it's a natural system. If you maintain plant health and ensure that you know, these plants are healthy and get the nutrients they need, then the system will definitely keep functioning. Um, sometimes you will have to do major rectification works. When you have a filter system, over time it's going to clog, and this is the case for any kind of filter system we use. When you have a large water body, that captures a lot of the sediment, at some point you'll need to dredge it so that you free up that capacity for sediment in the years to come. But ultimately, it is a pretty big challenge. I highlighted the case earlier about asset management for blue-green infrastructure where we don't even know yet how to properly allocate the task to different divisions and different disciplines within a municipality. And so that in itself is the logistic challenge. Adding to that, we don't have proper centralized ways of managing asset information. Um, you're dealing with a pretty big, um, a pretty big task, um, especially in urban water systems. There are ways people are starting to incorporate the information management in a more efficient way into their asset management databases. 
but we don't have proper documentation of all the assets yet. And I've done some uh, research topics where I've looked at uh, pipe networks and I've looked at blue green infrastructure assets and the data is variable. Data quality can be anything from we know where a system is located and what system is this, but nothing else, to we know where a system is located, how old it is, when it was built, what are some basic design uh, specifications. And if we're going to centralize this and come up with decent decisions about how a city, which consists of many municipalities, how a city is going to develop in future and how to do this sustainably, we definitely have to improve asset management a lot more and a lot more substantially in the years to come. So I've provided a brief overview of the three main streams. Well, it wasn't brief, but um, as you can see, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of um, governance that goes into these aspects. Um, and if we take a step back and we really try and see how this entire picture looks, we can see there's a huge integration of many aspects. This graph illustrates quite nicely um, all the different aspects to be aware of. On the one hand, we've got the policy, the design, management, and planning options. Um, we're looking at you know, fluxes into the system and fluxes coming out of the system. And this is not just water related. We're looking at materials, we're looking at energy. Uh, we have to consider the environmental impact that all of them have. And there's always the economic aspect looming in the background. We work across different timescales. Many of these processes can happen over years, such as looking at reservoir levels for water supply, to days looking at rainfall events and flooding incidences across the city, looking at spills, pollution of receiving waterways. And we have a number of different uh, stakeholders that are involved. And a lot of this is also being informed constantly by new science around urban water management that is being published and ways that this science is being translated into practice. And so in recent decades, uh, greater realization for using a more holistic view or an integrated um, approach to water management uh, has grown. And this is where urban water management has now progressed. Historically, one of the most um, overused, in my opinion, diagrams, but a very clear picture of how urban water management has evolved is this one, where we went from the need to secure a safe and secure water supply, um, the access to that, that explains why many cities have been built along major waterways, to public health protection with the outbreak of waterborne diseases and the need for sanitation. Realizing then that safety and flood risk has become an issue, we start to drain our cities. Incorporating more environmental sensitivity into the picture, as well as social amenity, we've started closing this water cycle, trying to manage water in a more, I guess, a socially acceptable way in a more cyclic way. Um, realizing that we are limited in the natural resources that we have available to us, we really try and make this a city a water cycle a city. Uh, and this is progressing uh, along the timeline of sustainability where more and more factors, this longer to-do list that I mentioned at the start, is becoming much more prevalent. The current vision, as at least in Australia, is that of a water-sensitive city where we're really looking at the economics, the social side, the environmental aspects, as well as suitable technologies to really um, make the city sustainable for current and future generations. Many people in the literature have tried to suggest what comes after that. I've seen many examples, hence why I keep saying this is the most uh, overused diagram I've seen. Um, but to be honest, we have, a, we have an idea of where we're going, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I would say we are around the waterway city, between the waterways and the water cycle city. We have a better understanding of what the needs are and what our potential challenges are in future, but we are still trying to find ways to really make this business case work. So integrated urban water management is sort of the current paradigm that we're in, and there's no single textbook definition of what it actually entails. But all I can say is it is a whole of systems approach. We're trying to consider the human needs, the environmental needs. We're trying to consider the different water services we need to provide. And we want to do it in a sustainable way and a way that is resilient to future changes and future challenges. We've got so many different drivers um, and challenges that we're facing, population growth, climate change, urban development, and how that can affect the environment, biodiversity loss, you name it. And so 
integrated air mobile management is really about how we can really harness um, the interactions within the water system. And it's also about multifunctional benefits. When we put an infrastructure in, we want to make sure that it's not in there for a single purpose. If it can provide an additional benefit, why not? Reduce energy consumption, great. Provide a healthy, livable environment for humans, great. Conserve biodiversity uh, and provide natural environments for nature, great. But it's really addressing both the human and the ecological needs. And we have to be diverse and holistic about this, involving all members of the community, not just the people in charge of making decisions, but also the community who are going to be benefiting from this service. There are five key principles. I'm not going to go into this in detail because I could spend an entire lecture and course on this. And um, I've talked about this in the past as well. But these five key principles are what we're trying to really implement in practice now, which is considering all parts of the water cycle, natural constructed surface, subsurface, and how they all interact. Considering all requirements for water, both the human and the environmental ecological needs. Looking at the local context, realizing that there is no one solution that fits all. Um, we need to be aware of the local context and how we can match the solutions to the problem that we have in our particular space, but also how that solution may affect the surrounding environment. It is a decision process that should include all stakeholders, community as well as the people in charge of managing the infrastructure. And finally, striving for sustainability. So balancing the environmental, social, and economic needs in the short, medium, and long term. How do we deliver integrated urban water management? So you've seen a few examples throughout the lecture of where we've had pieces of infrastructure, but we've also had policy and what we call non-structural tools, whether it's education campaigns, public seminars, education um, you know, of or capacity building, as we call it, of experts in the field, uh, people who make the decisions, uh, lobbying, engagement, pricing schemes, maintenance regimes. Um, it's really a case of combining both an infrastructure solution with the appropriate non-structural tools to really harness the benefits we get from integrated urban water management. I think we've made a lot of um, leaps and bounds in terms of the structural solutions with a whole toolbox but um, we're now only starting to learn how some of these non-structural solutions, whether it's regulation and policy, whether it's campaigns or education, uh, how they are starting to really enhance the benefits we get from our structural measures. So I've talked a lot about that. What I sort of want to finish off is some of my own experience in how models can support uh, integrated urban water management. Um, and we're really talking about numerical models. So I work in the space of geographic or geospatial models where we put in information about the city and how it looks like, where are the houses, where are the roads, using geographic information systems. Um, you can call it a serious kind of SimCity. I'm not sure how many of you would have played SimCity in your life or any kind of city building games, whether it's on your smartphones or on the computer. Um, but essentially these kinds of games run along the same kind of principles as uh, these bigger models that we use to try and help plan cities. Um, I work in the field of integrated modeling. It's where we really try and combine detailed models of different aspects of a city together to look at the interactions and how these interactions can be harnessed. In Europe, for decades, they were modeling catchment, sewer, treatment plant processes to see how, as I said earlier in one example, how we can harness extra capacity of a sewer to actually um, protect the treatment plant from being overloaded. There's some further reading um, I put in this slide to give you a bit of an idea of how these models are used in a policy setting uh, and how these different types of integrated models have existed in urban water management. So feel free to read a bit about them if you're interested in knowing more. In my particular case, I developed a tool uh, called Urban Beats, which we use to try and plan blue-green infrastructure in urban areas. The tool itself is a pretty big model and it does a number of different things. But I thought I'd show you some snapshots of a particular case study that, um, that I worked on just to demonstrate how models can help provide visual but also very useful information to stakeholders. 
So this is a, a section of Melbourne. It's a 1,200 square kilometer area, and it was designated as a planning zone for a number of stakeholders to come together and plan out what the future um, urban water management could look like in this area. We took this and fed this information, so basic input about the land use and the population, as well as some topographical information into Urban Beats. Now, Urban Beats models a number of different things, but a few things I wanted to show was, for example, water consumption. <coughs> um, the water consumption is based on an end use analysis where we try and say, okay, people use the toilets how many times per day, they shower how many times per day, and through this information, we can start to calculate what the total water demand across the area is. Now, Urban Beats also helps you break down this water demand. So by using simple parameters, we can then also estimate what portion of that is for hot water, what portion of that is used for garden irrigation. And you can already see in these plots how garden irrigation, for example, could be higher in certain regions um, compared to other regions. And this, this gives you a bit of information about, for example, if you're trying to harvest and use water, so if you're trying to harvest stormwater, where are some of the areas you might target? If energy is of concern, which areas use the most hot water? And maybe you might want to consider introducing some energy saving schemes or solar heating uh, in these particular regions. Furthermore, when we start to look at wastewater and grey water, because water supply often, that water use becomes wastewater and then grey water as well, which is a subsection or subcomponent of wastewater. Uh, we can start to see spatially if we want to recycle our grey water or if we want to use our grey water for irrigating uh, green spaces, um, which areas are most suitable for this kind of strategy. So this is just one of many different things that Urban Beats can give you. Another particular example is uh, related to green spaces and livability. So if it's not just about water but providing urban amenity, what might the model give us? Walkability is a big issue because, as I mentioned before, parks have certain health benefits um, for residents and recreation. And so we can look at where green spaces are located in the model and also where people live as a result of that and do some stats, spatial stats. And by looking at this region, we can already start to identify perhaps which areas could benefit from more green spaces. Now, if you think broadly in a more integrated way, green spaces are natural surfaces. They can potentially provide flood protection. They can provide uh, good spaces for biodiversity enhancement. And here you can see, for example, um, that the average distance, just purely based on the bird flies, you know, Euclidean distance, as we call it in geospatial analysis, that people on average will live around 350 meters away from the nearest park. Is this walkable? And this is something that you would want to discuss with the stakeholders in charge for green space planning. Definitely, if we look at the map, there are a number of room, uh, number of spaces where we could improve, um, you know, the provision of green space. And these are these are kinds of considerations that municipalities uh, actually write into their plans. To further go, you know, to go further, we can also look at the corridors. So I mentioned recreation people will tend to cycle across the city because, you know, physical activity is always good for the body and mind. And if we want to ensure that cities are safe places for people to live and to, uh, and to enjoy, then connectivity of the green spaces is quite important. Connectivity of green spaces is also important when we think about local biodiversity because it allows animals to move across the city. Uh, and this is important for genetics and making sure that species diversity is maintained across the environment. So one analysis we can do in Urban Beats is looking at how connected are these different spaces to each other. And once we overlay that with other information, such as what is the total area of man-made surfaces, as I mentioned earlier, it's a pretty, uh, pretty big issue because it causes a lot of the, the problems we see uh, with stormwater management and the environmental degradation that goes with it. We can overlay that kind of map, plus we can look at where all the waterways are located to try and form a more holistic picture of where might the best bang for our buck be if we're going to make investments. Where can we really improve recreational aspect, biodiversity value, as well as dealing with water management challenges. And so in this particular example, we notice that the coastline, so the bay is actually just uh, west of this region along where this dotted line runs. Uh, we figured that the coastline is one particularly attractive area that could be improved. 
Furthermore, if you look at the inner city area, so the, the CBD is just north, um, just underneath the livability, the word livability, um, we notice that the inner city suburbs where this big question mark is could also be dramatically improved given the lack of green spaces or the very you know smaller bits of connected patches of green spaces um, that are currently in this area. So these are some, some aspects that we can use the Urban Beats model for. Uh, I mentioned we can use Urban Beats to plan out what kinds of blue-green infrastructure we can place. Uh, this is a particular example where we tested our model against a real design where an engineering consultant actually went ahead and placed different assets or designed different systems for water quality objectives and stormwater runoff objectives. The paper itself is published, so if you're interested in knowing a bit more about the model, feel free to look up this paper or feel free to ask me any more questions um, in regards to the model and I'm happy to show you more. But getting to, I guess, the end of this particular lecture, I've given you a fairly well, in-depth um, in depth overview of urban water management and the complexities around it. And there's still a lot that we can do to improve it. But if I had to summarize the key takeaways, that would be five main ones from this particular talk. It's definitely becoming a more proactive instead of reactive approach. We have a longer to-do list, but I feel like we are no longer reacting to um, things that are happening in the world and having to manage these things. We are actively acknowledging that sustainability is a serious goal. Biodiversity along with that, climate change is certainly something we have to deal with um, and that we are no longer in a stationary scenario where we can just use a recipe book to come up with solutions. And supply sanitation and drainage are evolving accordingly. We have new technologies, we have new ways of doing things, and we're involving a much more diverse group of stakeholders. Where previously we relied on the engineers to deliver um, the main services, we now have so many more people involved, including the local community. The integrated approach is recognized. It's useful for addressing a lot of the future challenges, um, but it's really something where we, we are trying to now design systems with multiple benefits. We want to provide the urban water service, but we also want to provide many more benefits in the long term. This helps with the economic business case, especially when we have yet more pieces of infrastructure to manage on an already very long list of infrastructure. It's still a logistical challenge. I think people are trying to find new ways to understand how to deal with it. And I, I say we're actually getting there. We're slowly getting there. The centralized versus decentralized debate is quite prevalent now. Um, and this is mostly due to the fact that many centralized systems are nearing the end of their lifespan. And so the question remains, do we want to now renew it and just keep going with business as usual and lock ourselves in for another 50 to 100 years? Or do we want to actually try something new and maybe approach the problem with solutions that are more optimized for the particular situation that we're in? And so there's no one size fits all solution. We cannot simply use a cookie cutter or a recipe book. We need to really start thinking more strategically. Urban water governance, I've touched upon it briefly and across the entire lecture as well, but it is still a big challenge. And partly because of how evolving it is and how many new types of disciplines and stakeholders are coming on board, as well as the fact that a lot of the knowledge that we are now pumping into urban water management is quite new. And we need to be very cognizant of the fact that, you know, we're going to have failures, we're going to be taking risks, but unless we do something, unless we act, um, we're never going to see whether these systems and these ideas will truly work or not. Uh, fortunately, numerical models are advancing to support integrated urban water management in a variety of ways. Uh, we're using them to explore and experiment with different policy ideas, different design and planning ideas. And most importantly, they can really help facilitate that dialogue between stakeholders and allows us to test different opinions. Ultimately, it's our way of trying to incorporate a lot of the latest science and the evidence-based knowledge into the decision process. And they truly sit at the science practice interface. So that was all I had for you today, but um, I'm more than happy for you to contact me at my email um, if you have any questions or are curious about any of the research I do. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And I really enjoyed this opportunity to talk to you a bit about urban water management. Thank you very much.